G'day, Jesse. Today we're going to be talking about the very first Impact GFW event. Uh, just before they were merging, and this is the process where they did merge. Zanzibar, McCool, what do you think about a GFW in general? Uh, GFW, uh, back in the day, was out of trash. And still is, apart from all the stuff that they've stolen from TNA. Right. And what kind of stuff are we talking about here, just so we can differentiate um, it? Everything, like... <laughs> Like, the current champion is Eli Dragon. He's just, I'm the shittier version of EC3. Well, we're going to be talking about Slammiversary 15, which was where Impact finally had that merger with GFW, and they got rid of all the Impact titles, and we uh, unified them with GFW titles. Um, so, we're going to get into this. Obviously, it has been a while. We are doing this at uh, at a suggestion, so please forgive us if memory isn't uh, what it should be. Um, in our first we could match, could have done research, but that's too hard. Could have done research, but you know, it's best. Uh, it's it's best off the cuff. And I'm I'm not I'm here to do research. Exactly. Um, I'm, I'm the talent. <laughs> Jesse's the talent. I just merely put him in the format, and we listen to him go. So Jesse. Our oh, first match was Mahabali Shira, Braxton Sutter, and Ali going up against KM, the guy that just has KM on his shorts that Johnny Impact was talking about, Congo Kong, and Laurel Van Ness in her drunken bridal attire. Now, this match, uh, you know, the... <laughs> The less said about this match, the better, because it's like, I feel like Congo Kong is just not enough of a monster heel to come across as such, and it's like, the faces, I, I think that Mahabali Shira, he, he's like quite charismatic, I like him, uh, you know, Ali is, you know, uh, her whole gimmick of essentially just being adorable, that that works, and... Um, I'm Toad Storms. Uh, well, I'm glad she never says that, but I, I feel like she's doing a you know, good these days when she's teaming up with Rosemary, um, and they have that whole... Who isn't teaming with Rosemary? Uh, sexy star in AAA. Oh. Uh, but anyway, oh. <laughs> so, as we look back to the past to review this event, um, it's surprising when you look at it, but they didn't really do anything more with Congo Kong after this. Like, he's still around, but he hasn't been involved in anything major, and perhaps the, that's the best place for him? It's because why would you use Congo Kong when you have access to Abyss, the much better TNA version of Congo Kong? This is true. Is, right. You've seen a pattern here, Stuart? I, I, I am seeing a pattern here. Already we're getting into that. Um, but, you know, this was their equivalent of the pre-show match. Uh, and so, as such, it was very short, quick to the point. Uh, it ends with Mahabali Shira, Braxton Sutter, and Ali uh, winning over KM, uh, Laurel Van Ness, and Congo Kong. And it's like, they never really built anything past that or from that. So it's just like, okay, forgettable throwaway. And now looking back at it, we can just be like, yeah, not really much came out of that. So it kind of deserved to be on the pre-show of Slammiversary. Our next match, however, and um, if I just... I'll name everybody, and then I'll, I'll what I'll do is I'll try and refresh some memory, because... This is where we're going to get the first time ever that you, Jesse, were introduced to the, like, I hate this kind of match. <laughs> so, we had Gaza Jr. and the Laredo Kid with Drago and El Hijo del Fantasma going up against Naomichi Marafuji. And Taichi Ishimori with the final contenders into this four-way lucha tag team match being the Latin American Exchange, LAX, Ortiz and Santana. So, with Ortiz and Santana being in this match, I suppose they're like representing the company since everyone else was from external places. Um, just for the people at home, I'm going to 
show the picture to Jesse just so he can see if he can remember anything because this was his exposure <laughs> to most of these people because aside from LAX, uh, I'm assuming that you don't really know many people there. I, I remember Drago. Mm-hmm. Oh, Drago. That's, that's about it. <laughs> Well, I mean... Even the LAX guys are like, well, that, that, that's not the two guys from LAX I know. <laughs> so, I will say this. Uh, whenever we're doing these reviews of these kind of matches, it's always difficult because the Lucha-style match where they involve everybody goes incredibly fast, a mile a minute. Everyone is doing something, usually, even the people on the, the turnbuckles. So, it's more of a a mixed bag and it would require multiple viewings of the same match to try and get everything. And even then you'd be spending like almost uh, 40 minutes talking. Mexican wrestling is much like their language. A lot's going on, but not much is being said. And you know what? I I feel like there are intricacies that we wouldn't understand as well because neither of us speak Spanish, but uh, we also, with that in mind, uh, we're not really since we are watching a uh, American-style pro wrestling show, uh, when this comes out of nowhere and they introduce us to none of the people, it's like, yeah, I'm okay. Not, I'm, not, I'm not saying that there are no good wrestlers in, in AAA. There, in, are, there are plenty of very good wrestlers, but I have not seen them do anything because I don't understand what the fuck is going on in the match. Ex- exactly. And, you know, I think that's, like, one of the biggest barriers because... Uh, this will be the first time uh, that it's said publicly, but Jesse is not a real big fan of AAA, and it's not for the reason you think. And if I if I completely say this wrong, just correct me, Jesse, but it's mainly for the fact that they don't do singles competition. It's all just everybody in the ring, because uh, the fans really like the frenetic, fast-paced, multifaceted part of like having so many people in the ring, and people just follow who they want to follow, but for us, it's a little overwhelming because you don't really... I have no, I'm not a fan of anyone, so I'm trying to see what any of them are doing to become a fan, and I can't follow anyone. And that's, so yeah. it's like, all right, so no one's getting over. Not to mention no that doing anything. currently in AAA, the, the Psycho Circus, which Maka loves, but he's not here uh, to defend, unfortunately. Uh, it's uh, the fact that they're so involved in almost every stage of the promotion. Half of the roster is clowns. <laughs> Well, you know, you got to promote it, right? Um, so, <laughs> That's amazing I will say that both uh, Marafuji uh, and Santana, they were, like, really, really good. They were fast-paced in this. Like, they did a, a sort of chop challenge amongst each other, and they would, like, Santana would, like, kick uh, and do all these, uh, like, rapid... It, it looked like it was laid in quite painfully, but, you know... I. Obviously, that's just the look at it. And I can always re- appreciate that LAX, they do their gimmick really well, and it's extremely believable. So when they get in there and they uh, wrestle this really rough and tough kind of style, it it also adds to their character. Um, so, like, Laredo Kid, um, he came in, and it was against Ishimori. And I felt, and this might sound weird, but the guys from... Uh, Japan, the pro wrestling Noah guys, they didn't look the best in this match. Now, I understand that you're going up against, like, people that are, you know, uh, young, and, well, when you look at uh, Drago and Phantasma, they're, like, very established people. They've been in AAA for a very, very long time, and LAX automatically have our eyes, but I, for the most part, I wasn't impressed with Marafuji and Ishimori. Um, I, I suppose it was just, like, you know, uh, watching the other people, like, I would keep an eye on LAX, like, um, Ortiz came in, and he did, uh, a great, uh, suplex, and I'm just, like, watching this stuff, and I was like, oh, man, uh, the AAA team, like, both of them were, like, working so great together that you could tell that they are used to this whole style of thing down in AAA, and the AAA, like, team moves, they were fucking great. Um, now... Even, I feel like, Drago had this almost botch-like moment uh, where he fell from, like, the rope, but it was done in such a way where I'm just like, shit, is he doing, did he do that on purpose? Because, like, he, it, it, the way that he did it and recovered from it so effortlessly, like, it was just like, I'm not sure 
And, you know, that's the best thing because I can't say, hey, that was a botch now because I... Yeah, well, that, that's what they say, right? A good wrestler, if you botched it, you didn't realize it. Exactly. Now, I mean, this match had a million different things involved. And to be honest, I wasn't really expecting LAX to lose their tag team championships here. Um, just because they're like, hey, here's a bunch of everyone from across the globe. And I'm like, it's cool that they invited yeah. a whole bunch of people to be in Slammiversary. I just wish they had some sort of promotion uh, to, like, explain each of these tag teams in more detail. Because, like, while I know about Drago and Phantasma, um, the other guys, I'm just like, who? And, you know, obviously there's going to be some... Uh, well, again, that's one of the problems with having so many people in a match. Yeah, and it's... Yeah, we have got so many times so time for a promo, right? Jesse, what do you think about LAX in general? Uh, they're fine. They're a very, they're a very good uh, heel stable. Um, I like everything they do, and I like how much of an arsehole they are. <laughs> yeah. Um, I especially really like with them, the, uh, when they had the El Patron uh, feud, that was, that was really interesting. Well, yeah. It was like it was like it was like almost like a that the old noble uh, Mexicans going against the cartel and all sort of stuff. It was had a really really cool feel to it. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. So like they're definitely very good at what they do, and all of their promos are really um, they're definitely menacing enough for to be like the heels and everything and all sort of stuff. And and the I, wrestling, I mean, it's it's fine. I mean, I couldn't say anything that impressive, and but like it's it's not terrible. One of the things I was going to suggest is that uh, with LAX, they 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 really live their gimmick, and I mm-hmm. I think that uh, GFW now, since the impact has finally just fully become GFW, um, it it really has a different style to WWE. Like when you watch it, it's a different feeling. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure what it is. Maybe it's the fact that it's less produced or. But well, it's also because they can like all like none of their like because WWE all their stars are homogenized to be like to fit the it's like having McDonald's food it all tastes like McDonald's but yeah because they have so many people from so many different places and they're all like it's a bit more indie because like you go to no, GFW so then you get bought out eventually by WWE so like it, they're all still just like trying to uh, build their own like they're all hungrier right so they're gonna be doing more more impressive stuff. And they're not, like, they're being told to actually go out there and try. Not like, WWE's like, hey, you can't do this move because this is this guy's move. Yeah, well, you can't do this move because we want the crowd to get more excited later on and stuff like that. Yeah, um, it's all, it's, it's, it's less produced, but it's also... Uh, more freeing, I guess. Yeah. It, it allows for more creativity from the individuals. Um, so next up after this match, uh, where LAX retained in that... Um, we had Joseph Park and JB do their promo. Now, Jesse, you and I watched Slammiversary uh, on the day, and something that I'll explain to the audience is we, Jesse and I, regularly keep up to date with what's happening in GFW. We 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 we, we really like the programming, and that's like mm-hmm. one of the reasons I've been kind of hesitant to talk about uh, Impact so much because it's just like. I, hey, here's, I, here's this good thing that happened. Yeah, it's like, well, here's this good thing that happened. Oh, here's, here's the thing. Like, when, when fucking Grado is like, oh, that, that's an interesting storyline. Yeah. It's just like, well, what, what is there to really critique? Like, obviously in that match there, it was a, it was a good match. It's just the only issue yeah. is the fact that we didn't know anyone that was out of GFW's control. It's just like, <sighs> we didn't know anyone from the other promotions. So it's like, I know that, uh, Garza Jr., and I think maybe even Laredo Kid as well. They stuck around afterwards, and like now we're getting uh, more and more with uh, Phantasma. But uh, Phantasma's pretty good. Yeah, um, I I can't really say much about that. But uh, our our next match after the Joseph Park and JB promo, uh, <laughs> we had uh, Eli Drake and Chris Adonis versus Moose and D'Angelo Williams. Moose. 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 So, <laughs> also the fucking the football star, yeah, Angelo Williams, mm-hmm. who managed to upstage everyone else in terms of wrestling ability. So, 
Here's... Boy, all right then. All right. Fucking D'Angelo Williams. <laughs> um, so, I mean, we constantly got botches from the announcer here. And don't get me wrong. I also do it in reviews. Like, for example, when we get a wrestler come in and they're like, this is my name here. This is my persona that I'm going by here. But I heard them constantly say, oh man, here's Chris Masters. And I'm like, hmm, you can't, you can't keep saying that because certain people have that trademarked. You can't say Chris yeah. Masters. And it sucks for Chris Masters because his finisher is like uh, the headlock. And so <laughs> when he... Headlock. And so it used to be called the Master Lock. Right. Not so much anymore. Uh, it's just the Adonis Lock. And I'm like, ah, all right. Um, uh, maybe get a better, better finisher, mate. <laughs> yeah. I I'm mean, gonna tell you how to wrestle, but if like, you, I mean, I'm going to headlock him and they're going to be upset. Like you've seen Chris Adonis's uh, full Nelsons. That's like his finisher, that kind of headlock that he does, where it's just like a, um, but yeah. I'm going to say that that botch continuously kept happening, and I'm just like, oh, man, that's a little awkward. Well, I mean, it's brand new. Uh, like the, this is the merger, right? So there's going to be some problems. Yeah, I guess. Um, so uh, Chris Adonis started to dominate the match, and then he was going in there, and his whole gimmick is he is the very sort of, uh, his, his gimmick is like he's this man that's a model, but he's not afraid of hurting people. He's like, if you could imagine, like, Dolph Lundgren, sort of, like, in a film as a bodyguard to somebody standing there, where it's like, he's very, he, yes, he works on his physique, not so much to beat people up, but to show off to people. He's like a buff bodyguard Dolph Ziggler, I guess. Um, he's young, so. And he's currently the bodyguard for Eli Drake. Now, Jesse, I'm going to give you a couple of moments to tell people why aren't you a big fan of Eli Drake? Uh, shithead, yes, sir. <laughs> <laughs> oh, goodness. Like, uh, when your entire gimmick is a catchphrase, that's just like, mm. Well, two catchphrases. It, it, like, it brings everything else you're saying down. That's the problem. Like, because everything you say has to end with the exact same thing. Right. It's like, ah, it's, mm, it's very, it's very much like 80s style of promo. And I style. feel like that means he would be loved by the WWE though, because they love the crowd chant. Yeah, but that's the thing. It's not, it's not even a good, it's not to chant with the, with the crowd. It's like just the thing he says. Eli Drake, or, and that is just a fact of life. Uh, yeah, that's, I don't know, I don't see people chanting that because it's just, it's a bit too wordy. Even Eli, Eli Drake's a bit too dumb. I I have heard people uh, chant the Eli Drake before, um, but usually no one says the fact of life thing, but he always ends it like dummy, that. Dummy, yeah. <laughs> dummy, yeah. Um, but no, you're right. He definitely is uh, a bunch of catchphrases. However, I'm going to contest you here and say that I think that his overall mic capabilities are above average. Yes, I will admit... Uh, that he does throw in those catchphrases all the time. And I can understand why he's trying to get them over because, you know, then you could sell that on a shirt. But at the same yeah. time, it's just like, he'll do this really great promo, something that is, as you said, reminiscent of like the 80s golden era. And I really like that personally. And he, it, when he says something, it, he, it looks like he believes what he says, which is also good in a promo. But obviously you always get taken out of it at the end when he's like, and that, is just a fact of life. Or he's yeah, throwing... He, he, you just see him trying to, like, market it. It's like, all right, uh, that was literally just to sell tickets. Like, I get that it's, it's it's literally all to sell tickets. Yeah. But, like, hey, don't, don't fucking make it as obvious. I don't uh, know. It's fine. You don't like the fact that uh, he's not subtle. I don't like the catchphrase. I feel like it's a bit... I don't like his gimmick. He's a very good heel, Stuart. <laughs> okay. Um, so... Uh, Moose eventually, and Moose is the, the Grand Impact Champion in this match, by the way, but it's not on the line. Uh, he eventually sends Chris Adonis packing, and then Eli refuses to come into the ring. He's like, no, I'm not going to come into the ring against you, Moose. I want D'Angelo. I want the guy that's never wrestled before. I want to go up against him. And so... Reminiscent of EC3. 
So they Moose looks at D'Angelo and he's like, "Do you agree to this?" D'Angelo's like, "Yeah, man, I can I, I can get in there. I can take this on." Um, which leads they both get in there. They lock up, which causes Eli Drake to get a little surprised. He's like, "Okay, this guy he he's able to do a lock up." So he immediately turns it into a shoulder tackle uh, to take advantage uh, and. Eli Drake's just, he, he stops the lockup because he's like, oh shit, uh, this guy might actually be something. So he does the shoulder tackage, takes the advantage, but as he's about to go down and, you know, deliver a punch to D'Angelo while he's on the ground, uh, D'Angelo Williams actually does a arm dragged pin attempt on Eli for a one count. <laughs> a one count, ladies and gentlemen. So yeah, it's like, yeah, yeah. we, we already know that Mr. Williams, he's, uh, you're already starting to climb that staircase to where it's like, yep, you're over with Stuart and Jesse. One counts are important, people. I can't... If there's one thing I can hammer home to everyone on these reviews, it would be that. Um, just count to one, guys. Like just... That. Yeah, it's like, if you're pinning someone and it's in the first four minutes of the match, just one counts are okay. <laughs> it's yeah, like... That's all you need. That's all you need. Even, like, even, even then, it's just like, hey, like, because, if you're like more than because, two moves in. Yeah, because then it sells people when it gets to two because it's like, shit, he's tiring out. He's wearing down. Um, but anyway, uh, after that scuffle, Eli gets a little bit worried and starts looking at Moose and then Moose tags in for Adonis and uh, then Eli's just like, oh, shit. Uh, and Eli did a botch. But Moose's mannerisms were able to save it because he started doing his whole, like, getting the crowd revved up to look at him and all of a sudden sort of pointed at Eli to make fun of him and all that. So the crowd then thought, you know, yeah, let's all join in and laugh at Eli like it's part of the thing and we should side with Moose to that. So Moose, you know, helped there. So Moose, uh, his mannerisms were able to save that. But Adonis then would come in and just continuously hit Moose. And Moose would get knocked to the ground. And every time he would try and get back up, he would just constantly get hit by Adonis. So he couldn't get on his feet. So, then some crazy shit happened. Because we got a standing moonsault from (laughs) D'Angelo Williams. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. I was like, what the fuck? (laughs) The, The match then quickly went out onto the floor. And Moose was like, you know what? I'm going to get a fucking table. (laughs) And so Moose went and got a table and he started setting it up and Adonis and Drake were like, oh, no, 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 no. We're not letting you set this thing up. They ambush Moose. And then, you know, Eli and Adonis, they set up the table and they're like, okay, we're going to fucking get you through this now. D'Angelo stops Eli from doing a table dive. And because of that, uh, Moose is able to recover and boot Adonis and set him up on the table where D'Angelo would deliver a body slam and uh, Moose would then powerbomb Eli through a table <laughs> yeah. and Moose and D'Angelo Williams would win via pinfall. It's like, holy shit. Um, but the thing is, I will give a lot of credit to this match because one, uh, Eli Drake and Chris Adonis were most definitely heels here in the fact that no one in the crowd wanted the heels to win. Oh, yeah. Two, Moose looked good in this match, which is, I mean, I don't mean to disparage Moose, but he's not the most versatile of wrestlers. His name's Moose. And his name is Moose. (laughs) Like, um... But three, I will say that D'Angelo Williams went above and beyond, especially for his debut match ever. Yeah. And it's like, this is his first wrestling match. And it was fucking astonishing. Yes, maybe the table uh, dive could have been a little bit more crisp. But it's like, this is this dude's first match. It was great. I was really, really happy about this. Um, your thoughts, Jesse? Uh, yeah, it's all pretty good. I feel like, yeah, like, me not liking Yellow Drake. Like, this is where it started, I think. Yeah. And then just like, I see him do promos and it's like, uh, this fucker again. <laughs> and like, Moose, Moose is, uh, fine. Like, he's, he's a good, he's a good all around wrestler, I feel. Mm-hmm. But, um, yeah, I, I was expecting anything from D'Angelo Williams and then just, just a fucking standing moon. So I was like, oh, okay, then. <laughs> well, that's okay. That's, yep, you're done. 
definitely one of the most impressive debuts in like years. Um, it was great. Um, and you know what? It might have been like one of those things that we would talk about for ages, if not for the next match, which I think is probably the most memorable match to you. Uh, because we got a promo from EC3 and Cowboy James Storm. Oh, man. And no. that was our next match, the strap match. So <laughs> EC3 versus Cowboy James Storm, where EC3 came out and started taunting. Because he's EC3, that's what he does. Yeah, man. Um, Jesse, what did you think of the build to this match before I go any further? <laughs> um... Not not since the Hulk Hogan days has there been a, a strap match of such proportions, Stuart. I I mean, I was half expecting EC3 to start saying it's a yappa pie Indian strap match. Yeah. But he didn't, because yeah. he's better than that. Yep, yep. Uh, he's, he's wrestling Jesus. He's <laughs> which is funny, because the guy... Uh, there's two people in wrestling. People call Johnny Impact uh, the Jesus of wrestling because of his looks and his hairstyle and, you know, the uh, general appearance. But Ryan calls uh, Seth Rollins uh, CrossFit Jesus. Um, So it's none of them. It's none of the conventional people. It's not someone that even looks like Jesus. It's just someone that's here to save wrestling. Being Jesus isn't in, isn't in your looks. It's, it's in what you're doing. It's in, it's how you present yourself as the savior of wrestling. It's when you take on the sins of a company and you turn, you're just like, I'm absolving those. He bears those. that weight himself and it's like, yes, I am, I, I am, uh, all the sins of impact. When you look at the man and he turns you into a believer, that's, that's what it takes. So James would throw some punches immediately and then be like, Essentially, fuck you, EC3. I'm going to start using this strap right now. <laughs> yeah. EC3 was going to... He was like, oh, crap. But he couldn't escape. EC3 already sold the need for the strap in that match. He's like, I. he tried to get away, but he couldn't. So Storm yeah. slammed EC3 on the ring apron. <laughs> EC3 was... He was pretty much on the defensive for most of this match until he managed to... Uh, make a hangman's noose with the strap and would then, you know, attempt to do that. But James Storm would no sell the strap hits. So James Storm would, you know, after the beating he got, uh, in the build up to that. Oh yeah. So James Storm was super pissed during this. Um, and there was one time where James Storm tried to go on to the top ropes while EC3 was down on the ground, and then EC3 just literally just pulled the strap and made James <laughs> fall down. <laughs> and uh, when that happened, EC3 started laughing, and he pulled out a pair of handcuffs. And so the ref was just like, you know what, I'm gonna, I'm gonna try and help out here, but. <laughs> The EC3 managed to get free of the strap and then pulled Storm into the post. Uh, Fucking James Storm wasn't pleased with this, so he hit EC3 with his own move, the one percenter. Yeah. And so then James James Storm, obviously, after this, he, he just dropped down. He was he was too beaten, and people were just like, "Oh man, what just happened?" Because like after the the one percenter, James Storm tried to go do something, and he just sort of staggered for a bit, and then he just fell, and then he he was having trouble like getting back up. So what EC three did is he's like, "I'm going to hit you with a modified pile driver," <laughs> and James was fucking dead to the world after that. Um, EC three pinned one two three. EC3 wins. So, EC3. Jesse, I am surprised. And why am I surprised? Because you like someone using the cowboy gimmick as well. You don't hate James Storm, which is... The, the uh, universe... He's a, lot, he's a lot more bearable when Ryan isn't standing next to me wearing a fucking cowboy hat. 
than say, oh man, James Storm is so good. When uh, Ryan isn't going to a rodeo wearing oh a cowboy God. James Storm God. hat. Fucking... Ryan lives his gimmick. <laughs> Ryan really lives his gimmick, for better or worse. Um, this was this truly was the uh, the the Jesse V Ryan match. <laughs> um, it's even better too, because because uh, now they have the whole uh, they've teamed up to beat the shit out of uh, the AAA AAA guys. Yeah. yeah, it's like oh shit. It's like the mega powers. I thought you two hated each other. We do. Yeah, we do. We just we hate the other guys more. It's great. You know that's how uh, that's how Street Zara started. So, we get told that Bruce Pritchard isn't there, who was the manager at the time, uh, and I suspect the reason wasn't he wasn't there and that he was doing more important things is because uh, Mr. Jim Cornette was on the way. Um, <laughs> but uh, our next match was uh, also one to talk about. We had Josh Matthews and Scott Steiner... <laughs> Versus Jeremy Borash <laughs> and Joseph Park. Oh, man. It's so good. All right. So, two of these people are the commentators. <laughs> yep. And somehow this still manages to be the best match of the fucking night. <laughs> <laughs> so, this match, uh, as everyone knows, is part of the the build. It, it was always taken like... a Well, it was taken in a comedy style thing and a joke. <laughs> But it was so fun. And yeah, just Scott just Steiner. Fun, just like they ring up Scott Steiner and he just appears and stuff. It's like, oh God, he's coming for us, JP. we got to get out of here. <laughs> what did you ring him for? So, oh, like, Josh starts the match and, you know, immediately we get Josh hitting Joseph Park. Um, and, uh, when JB finally comes in, <laughs> Josh Matthews tags in Scott Steiner. Yeah. And, you know, this match would go on for a while, and then it would happen to get pulled backstage. <laughs> and we get everything from a fucking golf cart chase with Scott yeah, Steiner in it. They're thrown in the pool for a while. And yep. then they're in the pool. And it's like, don't worry, JB, I have a friend. And then who comes out of the pool but fucking Shark Boy? <laughs> because like, everyone's like, oh man, it's going to be a bit. And the fucking Shark Boy comes out. like, oh great. Father Mitchell was there as like the representation of Satan. Um, yeah. So uh, Steiner was chasing people in a golf cart and he was just like, gotta get him, gotta get their fat asses. Oh, oh man. So with the uh Josh I think even did uh the Steiner recliner at one point. But anyway, yeah. Shark Boy as Jesse was mentioning had the distraction and you know JB gets taken back, but Abyss comes in to oh, yeah, save yeah, JB. Abyss gets knocked out and then Abyss comes out. Mhm. It's like, "Oh shit." So, Josh Matthews gets hit by the black hole slam into thumbtacks. Yep. And then JB does a body slam from the top rope like they'd been training for in the pro- like the pool promos. Yep. And that's how JB and Joseph Park, maybe with the help of Abyss, win Next this up, match. Boy. But they, they, after the after the pay per view though, you see like on Facebook they had the video of like JB pulling all the fucking thumbtacks out of his arm. They're yeah, like, the commentator <laughs> doing that. What did you think? Like, Matthews Matthews had um like body armor. I was like something on to like stop it from like impaling his body. But like yeah, JB didn't have anything on his arms. What did you think of uh, this match, Jesse? Because it was a so it was a comedy style match. It was it was pretty good. It's like, uh, man, you can really tell that, like, the Hardy Boys have done a lot for wrestling. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And this is just like the next the next step in that path. It's like, oh man, so good. Plus, like Joseph Park, the best is fucking amazing. <laughs> Joseph Park is great. In all, like, if anyone was to do those, 
uh, Broken Hardy style uh, vignettes and those backstage segments. I'm glad that it's Joseph Park because he is definitely yeah. one of the people that is comedically uh, talented enough to pull that off as well. Plus, um, he has the wrestling ability. And oh, definitely. Just yeah. to abyss and just like, yeah, time to switch it on. And then Scott Steiner just just like appearing as like <laughs> Matthews is like, I got a friend that's gonna pick the shit. Out of you. It's like, oh, who? We got like, there's no one. And then just like Scott Steiner shows. I was like, oh. And then after that, like, all the promos are just like, yeah, Scott Steiner's is going to fucking kill us. <laughs> and a lot of the, the running backstage segment was just them running away from Scott Steiner. Yeah, <laughs> he's just chasing after him. Oh, man, it's great. Gets into the car. Oh, man, this was this was great. This was fun. And I was like, man, Slammiversary is so great. Yeah. Um, now, it's got the, everything. The next match has the unfortunate sort of... Uh, stigma of having to one follow all these great matches and two it's with people that we're not particularly too fond of i mean they all gifted in wrestling they can all they can all wrestle well it's just it's they don't really do anything for us it was the husband and wife match uh yeah yeah, yeah. the wolves uh were going up against one another with their wives involved so it was like Angelina Love Richards and Davy Richards versus Eddie and Alicia Edwards. Um, man, uh, this was the Full Metal Mayhem match, which means you got your your tables, you got your metal uh, trash bins and stuff like that. You've got you know tacks and stuff. So it's an extreme style match, and I I think that this was done really well, but as I was saying, it just had no way to compete with the gimmicks of, you know, Scott Steiner, Joseph Park, obviously. Yeah, it probably the, should have come earlier than that. Yeah, if it had come earlier, it definitely would have been more well-received. I mean, we got great kicks from Eddie Edwards. And when he uh, ran into Davey, Davey did a flip <laughs> and hit a ladder. And it was like, yeah, oh, yeah. fuck, man. <laughs> that, um, so... Davey would hit a brain buster and then Angelina would start hitting people with the kendo stick. And I forget what happened in exactly like who it was, but I know that Eddie Edwards had tacks poured into his mouth. Yeah, I remember that. And I think it was Davey maybe... That then did, did a super kick. T- yeah, he yeah, did a super yeah. kick to his mouth while it was filled with tacks. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I was like, Jesus, fuck. Oh, man. Uh, like, and even, like, when you look at, like, Alicia and stuff, she power bombed Angelina through a table. And it was just like, <laughs> what the fuck is going on here? Like, uh, like, all this stuff was happening, but that wasn't it for, like, Eddie, even though he had those tacks in his mouth. No, no, no. <laughs> He went up the ladder with Davey and he power bombed Davey off the ladder into a table. <laughs> I'm just like, fuck Jesus. And the worst part about all of this is the fact that with those horrible things in mind, it's like the match it was it was good, but aside from the the you know the thumbtacks in the mouth, it's like Compared to everything else on the night, it just didn't stand out. Yeah, and that sounds problem. crazy. Uh, GFW has a problem with everything is too good, so everything is sort of like the same level of like, eh, it was great, but everything else is also great, so there's nothing really stand out. Again, that's the it's a problem with billing your uh, each match like it's going to be good. And you know what? I, I think that... Like, like this wouldn't happen in WWE because no. they'd make everyone else shitter. Just to make the other one like, oh, there we go, that was good. Um, I... Like shutting the fans down, basically. I wasn't the biggest fan of the Wolves when they were a tag team. Uh, I just... I knew that they were good. They were just lacking that, like, charisma, I guess. They were slowly getting there together as a tag team, but then they broke apart. And I just was kind of, eh, on the whole breakup thing where they're just like, oh, now this is... You know, I'm going to 
talk about how cool my wife is and how your wife sucks and then it just culminates in well what if we got both of our wives and brought them to the ring it's just stupid <laughs> yeah exactly no your wife is dumb no your wife's dumb so we, we had our wife's fight we had a another belt match to to follow this and I'm gonna get your thoughts on the wrestlers involved Jesse because <sighs> Unfortunately, the state of the division at the moment isn't that great. But we oh, had Low sad. Key versus the X Division champion at the time, Sonjay Dutt. Right. For the best two out of three falls match. What do you think about both of these people, Jesse? Uh, Low Key is very good, just in general. Um,. I feel like he gets the raw end of every stick he tries, though. <laughs> and I feel like Sanjay Dutt is the exact same way. Maybe <laughs> not as charismatic as Loki. But Man, I mean, his wrestling ability is just as good. It's such a simple but effective gimmick of wrestling in the, like, Hitman style suit. Yeah. Like, I'm Hitman. So, like, you know, <laughs> I'm the professional Hitman. It's like, okay, yeah, I know, I know what you're about now, Loki. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's just like... Everything like, we need to know. And then he goes in there and he great. shuts shit down. And it's like, oh. Yeah, he just fucking... It's just amazing. It's, it's, it's fucking so good at wrestling. It's like, oh my God. So, uh, what are yeah, your thoughts I on Sanjay? I was definitely going for Loki. Uh, Sanjay Dutt, I feel... I don't know. He is... Just he needs something uh, more to put him over in my eyes, I think. Mm-hmm. Like, nothing, nothing to do with his actual ability. Just, like, some like interesting gimmick about him, though. And, I mean... We've seen him in, like, the GFW Amped anthology. Mm. Um, and it's, like, it's always, like, he's doing really well. It's just there's something missing as part of the complete package there. Like, even if it's just something is, like, for example, as we were just talking about, Loki suit, which is just, like, yeah. that is something to define him as who he is. That is almost everything about he's him. He's still indie man right now. <laughs> yeah, and that's it. He... And it, it's... And he's it, not Jigsaw. <laughs> he's not Jigsaw, because Jigsaw beat him. Oh, God! <laughs> no! <laughs> Fucking Jigsaw. Anyway, this <laughs> match... This much for me. There was a test of strength into a pin attempt. But yeah. Sanjay was like, nah, we're doing the Hurricane Runner into an armbar. And I'm like, <laughs> Hurricane Runner into armbar? Holy, okay. Okay, we're going. This is an X Division match. This is... Yeah, did you forget it's X Division? Yeah, man. Um, This is where the crazy shit happens. Yeah. So, we got some excellent wrestling from Sanjay Dutt and his mat wrestling right there. It was just like, as we were just saying, Sanjay Dutt, he's really good at what he does, just missing one component. Um, Sanjay Dutt would... Tag team. Fucking amazing. Sanjay Dutt would eventually do a DDT. Um... But uh, low key would still be maneuvering around, and then he would do. I think it was the double foot drop into a pin attempt, but he didn't get it. So low key did his move, which he calls the Warrior's Way, which is where he does <laughs> Finn Balor's coup de gras uh, sort of uh, foot stomp, but it looks good. It's so like, what, if, what if Finn Balor had talent? Yeah, it's so Finn Balor. Come at me, he, Finn Balor isn't on the Warriors' way at the moment, um, which would lead to the first fall. Now Sanjay would sell this fucking stomp for the rest of the the match, and Low Key would then get ankle strain after constantly doing the stomp attempts, and you, he would start being also like selling that, even though. I would almost say he started overselling it because it was like a point where it was becoming a hamper to like almost watch him slowly go about the rest of his match because I'm yeah. like, he, he like handicapped himself, which is the, yes, the psychology and the storytelling is great. But at the same point you stopped and you took away half of your arsenal to make this a really exciting and frenetic match. And you still had like, you know, you still needed to make that final pin. You still needed to 
prevent uh, Sanjay from getting a pin, so to draw it out to the third fall. So because of that, um, and that story being told, uh, Loki... There's too much story in this <laughs> I, I think he got it because he did the warrior's way to the steel steps from the top rope. Yeah. And, um... They'll do. So, anyway, we get a, another pin attempt from Loki with the sore ankle, but Sanjay just reverses this pin to get the, the quick one, two, three out of that, and Loki is pissed <laughs> because he's just like, I f- fucking should have had that. That's... That's bullshit. You can see that on him. Um, and so, Loki hits Sanjay and hurts his hand. Not his hand, but Sanjay's hand. <laughs> and he would continue to hurt Sanjay. And in fact, there was a point in the final round where Loki's decided, I'm taking my gloves off. And so when the gloves came off, he immediately did a cartwheel into a kick. Doesn't require uh, fists, but sure. And, well, he, he did need to spin and put his hands on the, the mat for the cartwheel. <laughs> right, that, that's, that's what it was. And, well, he then <laughs> followed it up with a Michinoku driver. like, uh, it, And it was just like, man. So, he Loki starts fucking working on Sanjay Dutt. And get it, he's getting, like, this anger out, and he's like, I'm going to just pulverize you into nothingness, and then I'm going to finish you off. And so he throws Sanjay, and, you know, he, it's he's taken complete dominance. Uh, anyway, Sanjay ends up in the Tree of Woe position. And he is slowly, like, dazed, and he can't do anything about it. So Loki's, like, perfect. I'm going to go and finish him with the warrior's way while he's in that tree of woe position. He can't do shit about it. Um, I'm just going to fucking do that straight on his head. <laughs> Sanjay then pulls himself up with, like, I guess it would be upper body strength, just does a sit-up and then pulls on Loki's tie. Yeah, and yeah, it's yeah. like, it's one of those moments which, like, you could see it done in a film or a movie. Like, not well, the same thing, but it's like... Uh, I've, it was very cinematic in the fact that Loki's downfall comes from his attire and the fact that he wears it to show off and be impractical. Yeah. The fact that his tie comes out is what Sanjay needs to pull him down off the top ropes, like off the top ropes, and then he Sanjay climbs the post and then hits the warrior's way on Loki to win. Man. Sanjay Dutt retains from the pinfall there. Fucking great. X Division matches should... This is exactly how they should be. As I said, there might have been... Uh, I feel it could have been even greater, but I'm appreciative of the storytelling that was there and the way that it ended was perfect and I wasn't even considering this was going to go... You know, One of the things that I've talked about before is how whenever there's something that's like an iron match or a best two out of three falls match, yeah. I'm like, this is always going to go to the final round. It didn't even occur to me because of how dominant Loki was looking in the first two rounds and the fact yeah, that... Yeah, because of how, like, just, like, snap the uh, pin was, too. Yeah. And then it was just like, man, really, really good. Uh, so, next, we just had another sort of interlude segment, which was Gail Kim coming out. Yeah. And she was talking about how this is her last year in wrestling. Uh, at the end of 2017, she will no longer wrestle. So, uh, we now know that her final match will be at Bound for Glory in uh, 2017. Um, she was in like, Canada. she was, uh, it's fucking, it pisses me off so much because it's like, I was like, fuck's sake, I was in that area. Yeah. And I was like, I could have fucking literally <laughs> just gone to Gail Kim's last match. Um, uh, but, but, you know, uh, what are you going to do? You don't have Jesse Powers. You just show up to things and have them busy. I don't. I, I, I don't. I have to plan out for things in advance only to have people not show up. It's just like, <laughs> that's how it goes. I, I, I have the reverse of Jesse's, like, fortuitousness. Um, so, Gail Kim, obviously one of the best women wrestlers to ever lace up her boots, if not the best. Um, always great. 
And she came out, and it was just because they were like, here she is, and our next match, the co-main event, if you will, uh, was going to be the knockouts match. And it was going to be th- for the unification of the titles. <laughs> so, in the next uh, match, we had the GFW Women's Champion, Sienna, versus the Impact Knockouts Champion, Rosemary. Um, Jesse, your thoughts on these two women before we get started? Um, Sienna's... Uh... If I remember correctly, she's pretty pretty decent. She is. Um, she, I, I prefer her like a uh, like Rosemary's very weird to me. Like, <laughs> I don't know. I, I know that it's the point, and that it's it's like a very like specific gimmick, but I don't know. It's just not for me. Mm-hmm. It's more of a Macca thing. Oh, know, definitely. But, Oh, I'm 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 a demon possessed by thousands of souls. Like great. Macca in his younger days would have had the the Rosemary poster to be sure. Yeah, um, I don't know. It's fine. I mean, it's been annoying in promos, especially. It's weird because hero like, cut almost Paul Bearer esque promos. Yeah, no, not even that. It's just like I'm this. Per- I'm like thousands of souls merged into one being, and Air I'm Mac, after. Yo. And I have to, like, do a tag team to get a belt. That's <laughs> what I'm aspiring to. Yeah, because, like, you, like, um, cause Undertaker, right, mm. he, he had, like, a similar, like, dead man gimmick, right? Yes. He would come out and say, I'm here to take your soul. Like, mm. he wasn't in it for the championship. That's why he never got and never did a run. And But then Rosemary is. And I, the, it's, it's just very strange. As you were saying, it's like Undertaker, he would come out and he'd be like, I'm here for your soul. I'm here, and that's the whole reason that I'm wrestling. And then you had things where Paul Bearer is just like, I am using The Undertaker to get money for my funeral yeah. parlor. And so if he does well, I get more money. So <laughs> that would be like the explanation for why this zany character could exist, why this person that is a above the suspension of dis- like disbelief, why you could suspend it, because there there was this reason behind it. Rosemary is weird. Um, she's kind of just kept her decay gimmick, and now yeah. that decay is no longer there after being murdered by LAX, or supposedly, <laughs> I mean, <laughs> well, they were in hospital. That's what they said, but but they were dead to wrestling. Well, what what is it? Uh, Abyss only came back in that match before, but yeah. cr- crazy quotation mark Steve, he's crazy dead. Steve. <laughs> yeah, he's just dead. <laughs> Oh, well, you man. can't kill Abyss, right? You can't. Crazy Steve was just some fucking crazy guy, though. He he, he was a he was a crazy guy and <laughs> didn't fare too well for crazy guys. Um, <laughs> if only he'd known about the Psycho Circus, then uh, he could have he could have done something. And maybe if he'd waited a little bit longer, the AAA he guys could have been a clown. <laughs> maybe maybe he's also gone off to watch it or film it. Maybe he is it. <laughs> maybe he is like because LAX didn't fear him they were able to beat him um right. but is that what we're going with <laughs> Laurel Van Ness came out to interrupt this match and I was like no <laughs> <laughs> so then you know she comes out and doing all this shit I'm like oh fuck we're gonna get a distraction eventually Rosemary starts punching Sienna and she grounds Sienna doesn't stop the punches so, then, some, like, I, I think, somehow, Sienna just manages to get a hold of the pinky, and just starts biting Rosemary's pinky? And I'm like, so, okay. so she can punch a, punch a hole in the, in the soul, uh receptacle that is Rosemary, so it's not leaking out, so she loses power. I see. So that's how you defeat the hive. Yeah, yeah, just have to poke a hole and like a balloon will just deflate. So, is like <laughs> Rosemary like the Queen of Blades, like Kerrigan, since she says we are the leader of the Hive and she speaks in the royal we sense? Maybe she's like being controlled by like a like a bee inside of her and like the rest of the bees are sort of like making out the rest of her body. It explains the flower name. 
and then you have to like just well, beat the, the one bee. Yeah, so so once you beat the one, the queen bee, the rest of them will go away. I see. Well, uh, <laughs> some shit I don't know. It didn't explain that there was shitty Rosemary's gut kicks away. and Rosemary was doing an upside down pin on Sienna, which I was like, <laughs> what the fuck? Uh, Rosemary would then kick out of what they called Sienna's silencer and hit the Red Wedding. Um, Good scan of thrones. Gotta, gotta get in on that market, I guess. Uh, Laurel Van Ness would fucking distract the ref. So, the ref was like, oh, what are you doing, you crazy drunk bridal lady? Um, <laughs> and drunk then bridal. Ali would come out and chase her away with a kendo stick. Yeah. I'm like, Jesus, Ali. Getting all, you're going far more extreme than Bailey ever could. And, you know, you have similar Ali. gimmicks. It's just too powerful. And that's the thing. Like, if you look at... Bailey's gimmick, which is supposed to be like, oh, I'm lovable and huggable. And then you look at, like, Ali's gimmick, which is just like, oh, I'm all, you know. The difference is Ali doesn't try to try. (laughs) Uh, The difference is that Ali doesn't come out with fucking uh, a shirt saying, I'm a hugger, and then has, like, blow-up balloons that have hugging arms. As as a fucking emoji hugging itself. It's like, wow, not even in your your Titan trunk can you find someone to hug. (laughs) And Sienna... Uh, never did the this is your life segment to her god um, let's just do the same promo against her every single time so anyway did you know that she's a nerd that watches wrestling you should be ashamed you should be ashamed of yourself everyone watching wrestling right now um it's like we get it so the ref was watching Ali chase uh Laurel Van Ness away when Sienna was just like I'm gonna fucking hit Rosemary with my belt um, and Rosemary was like, oh, I'm going to use my demon mist a la the great Muda. But Sienna was able to block the mist in her hands and then put her hands in Rosemary's eyes. And so the whole gimmick of like, oh, you know, this is, this is either a small acidic thing, this thing, it, it's a pepper spray effect, but whatever, if it gets in your eyes, you're fucked and that's it. Um, yeah. And so then Sienna put the mist in the eyes of Rosemary and then put her into a submission and Rosemary would tap to unify the knockouts belt with the GFW women's belt to become the undisputed GFW women's championship. Sienna wins. I mean, that's fine. I it, mean, neither of them... Uh... Gail Kim, right, so... Yeah, exactly, and it's like, it's fine if you're getting the Rosemary gimmick match and then you get the distractions on the outside. This is... This is... This is what you get. Uh, we... Plus, it's like, it's, the, it's just the first champion, like, you know, if, if Sienna can wrestle, it's fine. And... Like the, all, all you need from the first champion is that, hey, are they decent? Yeah, and it's... We knew that somehow Sienna was going to win because she had the GFW title and we knew that the company was turning into GFW, no longer Impact. So it's like, well, they're not going to probably keep those around. It would be very weird for them to say, oh, look, the Knockouts title is the one that merged with the GFW title, but we're still going to call it the GFW title. It's like weird. Anyway, Jeff Jarrett came out to suck everyone's dick in the audience. Um... He was saying thank you everybody for coming and watching this and thank this you is for uh, ignoring me in order to uh, deal with this good wrestling. <laughs> and everyone's just like, "Yay, us!" Yeah, we're not, we're not, we're not here for you. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, that's pretty much all I'm going to say. All I can say really about Jeff Jarrett is that I prefer him talking to his wife. <laughs> I mean, what a choice. What a, yeah, I know, right? Our main event of the pay per view was the TNA, or sorry, the Impact <laughs> World Champion, because we were on that kick at that time. Yep. yep. Versus 
the GFW Global Champion, Alberto El Patron. Man, looking at this match, it's just like, this This does not end well for either of you. No. <laughs> um, you know what? I'm going to go out on uh, a controversial limb here. Uh, right. Not as controversial as people listening might be thinking. Yeah, because they could be very Because they could be very controversial. I'm just going to say that when it comes to this, these two people, I'm not going to say that uh, I go to a show based on either of these people, but I'm not insulted by them either. I don't, no, I don't hate either of these people. I feel like that's like, I mean, especially thinking of like WWE, like the the fucking main event guys are never really that like interesting, mm. just because they're all like they gotta be, they gotta be the big ones, because they're the ones that'll win. <laughs> you know, it's just, it's all like that kind of a whole. I mean, if the, the biggest people are usually the biggest name. Uh, like fucking look at Brock Lesnar, right? Yeah. And it's just like okay, just get the the beefiest guy that, that punches the hardest, and then make him the best wrestler because that's that's how it works. <laughs> Although, and then uh, the mid card is full with all the people that actually know what they're doing. I mean, the same was back in the eighties. Although like, I I will have to. I disagree with what I'm about to say, but just for devil's advocate and for some people in the audience that aren't exactly big Impact or GFW fans, there is a lot of similarities that could be made to what you just said with we look at Brock Lesnar and we look at Bobby Lashley, and if we look at uh, aging uh, wrestlers and then we look at Alberto El Patron, what would your uh, retort be to that statement? Like, why do these guys deserve to be the main event? Uh, well, Lashley does just win everything. They've definitely built him to be very strong. Like, I've never really liked Lashley that much. He's just sort of always been there. Mm-hmm. Like, um, at least Alberto can, like, wrestle pretty well. Yeah. So like him being there is like all right. This is the this is he's definitely the more the more of a wrestler. Yeah, I feel like it's like yeah, Lashley's just a bit like I'm just gonna hit him really hard, and that's 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 fine because that's what the MMA guys do. But it's just like it's not really wrestling, is it? So it, what what makes you find Lashley more tolerable as the Impact uh, World Champion? As opposed to Brock Lesnar being the WWE Universal I mean, Champion, I'm, I'm fine with Brock Lesnar being champion just because he is, you know, he does have that presence. I I prefer like Brock Lesnar is definitely more of a champion than Lashley is. Yeah, I feel like Lashley doesn't sell nearly as much. Like whenever you see Brock Lesnar, he's always like he definitely does like sell his matches, and he definitely the way they're building him now, especially. Mm. It's more like, hey, I'm actually being hit now because I'm an old man at this point. Yeah. But lastly, he's never really had... He's always been, like, billed as I'm invincible. Well, yeah, uh, I, I feel and like... And even the crowd, the, the crowd has never... They never cheer, they never boo, they just sort of, like, just don't... They just wait till he finishes his promo, almost. And I feel like on the... Uh, on a small side note, since we are looking back at this, how do you feel with... Uh, Lashley's gimmick at the moment, which is just like they're really focusing in on the fact that he he does Bellator MMA, and they're like, I, I, actually, I want him to leave. Mm-hmm. I, just, I want him to leave because, <laughs> like, especially how because right now he's he's a heel to me. I'm just like, well, if you don't fucking want to be here, just fucking go away. Just and that off. and that Stop is ruining the company. Then. That is perfect, Jesse, because that is exactly what they want. To hear that's that's exactly what they want to hear from people. They like. Almost like if you build things properly, the heels are heels and the faces are faces or something. So in this match, we I get. Don't understand them. I, I know, right? Um, we get a lock up, and then Lashley would immediately do a suplex. But Alberto El Patron's like, "Oh, you want to do suplexes?" So he did a suplex right back. Yeah. So the match would sort of. Uh, Oh, I should mention to everybody at home uh, that the MMA fighter King Mo escorted Lashley to the ring and uh, Alberto uh, El Patron's father, Dos Carros, 
was there as well? And his brother, I'm pretty sure. And his brother. Because um, wasn't this, like, after the match, like, some shit happened? Yeah. So, um, for example, King Mo hit Alberto El Patron. And, uh, so in return, Dos Caras did a chop to King Mo. And I will say, I will say, credit where credit is due to King Mo, he sold the old man's chop quite a lot. Well, and, yeah, man, I, I feel like people have to have respect for all the older wrestlers just because back in the day, the business was a bit rough. Oh, yeah, and I can only imagine some of the stories that Dos Caros could tell people having been a, you know, luchador through yeah. Mexico during all that time and making his name down there. It's like, man. So, you know, lots of respect there. Respect where it's given. Um, so that match would uh, go back into the ring and Alberto saw that Lashley was going for the spear. So because Alberto saw it, very old school style of uh, wrestling mentality, he saw it coming and being set up. So rather than stand there and get hit by it, he dodged out of the way. He's like... Yeah, his dad's watching. He can't just fucking sell some some bullshit like that. Well, yeah. So, in return, uh, Alberto El Patron would hit many clotheslines and just be like, I'm going to keep doing as many as I can to, like, just start wearing Lashley down. And so, obviously, close quarters, Lashley excels here with his background, starts laying into him with some really good-looking force. And I will give this credit to Lashley. He can look like he's fucking hitting you like a truck, and I could almost guarantee you that the opponent wouldn't be feeling much. It, he is experienced enough to make everything he do, like everything he does, look impressive and painful and strong, and build his like. He's technical where it matters. Yeah, yeah, it's like he is, he is massive. He like he's intimidating, but at the same time, it's just like. The way that he would do that stuff, it makes you certainly get that, okay, well, he he does deserve to be here in this spot. Because even though we might not like him and he is a heel, so that, that you know, already plays into it, um, he he's able to work very strong to his character, but not strong like, oh man, he's got, Al- Alberto's going to wake up tomorrow and just be fucking dead. Um, so... Alberto started going for top rope punches. Uh, So Lashley was like, no, 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 powerbomb time. So Alberto was like, okay, well, I'm going to hit you with my backbreaker. And then I'm going to do a suicide dive through the ropes. Which missed. So with that, Bobby got him back to the ring. And then bam, 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 more corner offense. Alberto was able to use this momentary lapse thing. He's like, all I can do is get around him and do the tornado DDT into his armbar submission. Now, Bobby Lashley is not going to tap out. No, no. So Bobby lifts him up and hits what we've been calling the alley-oop, thanks to Ali. <laughs> And throws Alberto El Patron mid-maneuver. Just fucking throws him halfway through it. He's like, no. Like, that in itself is like, okay, well, you know, I was talking about that stuff before. I mean, you're going to sell my telegraph shit and I got to telegraph shit. Yeah, man. And that's it. And so, you know, Bobby spends like a minute just fucking slapping Alberto El Patron. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, it... It's just like, oh, shit. So then Bobby would deliver an arm breaker to Patron and then hit his spear. And so he would get ready for another one. And he's like, okay, this second one is going to put him down to the for the count. Uh, but Alberto managed to do a drop kick to counter the spear. So they get t- to brawling once again and they get caught up into the ropes and we get a messy looking rope fall to the ground 
<laughs> and then Dos Karras walked over to King Mo and just kicked him in the balls. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, all of this great. match, I was like, man, that was really, that was a really good main event. I'm happy to go home from that, except for the ending. <laughs> yeah. Lashley gets distracted by Dos Karras, so he gets a kick from Alberto El Patron. And he stumbles around. And then he falls back into the ropes where he just holds himself there for ages. So that Alberto can run up and then hit a double stomp on him. I get it. I understand. It just looked way too choreographed. Like, he's just stumbling around. That was and the finishing spot, Stuart. I, I, yeah, but it's like... Because of how he was, how slow it took for him, and how long he just held himself also, there. How the rest of the match worked, it's like, well, this is very obvious. Yeah, I'm just like Jesus. So, Patron, that is the finishing spot with him. One, two, three. Alberto El Patron wins the match and unites the GFW Global Championship with the Impact World Championship. To become the undisputed GFW World Championship. <laughs> so, that match, pretty good. Didn't like the ending, but aside from that, this is probably one of the best matches you would get from these two if you were to put them uh, yeah. together. Yeah. yeah. Uh, final thoughts, Jesse, on the pay per view. I thought it was really good. Uh, yeah, I mean, everything from. Uh, like- Impact and then GFW and TNA before that. It's all it's all pretty good. Like from when I've been watching it all up to now, it's there hasn't been like there hasn't been a a pay per view I've watched that's like ah that was a bit eh. Like, it's, it's always there's always the same level of like quality because it needs to be right. And then it's like even when they're dying as a company, they're still like yeah this is <laughs> this is the best pay per view we can possibly put out there. That company's been dying for fifteen years. Oh yeah, man, like Rogue's a Million, just always going to sale. Exactly. Anyway, guys, that was our review. We watched that live on the day. Uh, we did come back to it a long time afterward at the suggestion uh, to review some stuff other than the WWE. Hope you guys appreciated it. Um, if this is something that you like to hear, then we, we, as I was saying earlier on, we do watch all of the GFW stuff. So, I mean... It wouldn't be too difficult to talk about. It's just usually I was I was afraid that there wouldn't be too much that you guys would like to hear because it's just all all positive and glowing stuff with the you know maybe one or two minor exceptions. Um, but thank you guys for listening. I'll catch you guys later, and I'll leave it to Mister Zanzibar McCool over here to have the final word. Uh, what? What? What are you this, man?